see it as a result of your past actions. So a question was asked by saying, if you are a Dharma practitioner, then what are the greatest faults? Greatest faults. The greatest faults are, for a practitioner, the greatest obstacles or faults are attachment and hatred. Attachment and hatred. With attachment, you get obsessed with things and you want to have everything come close to you, come towards you. With hatred, you reject. Go away. I have nothing to do with you. Get lost. So, one trying to collect everything, another taking out everything. And what, 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 what is the root of attachment and hatred? Ignorance, of course, as we already discussed. But he says, in the case of a monastic, a man or nun, it is the desire, attachment to the sensual objects. I think this is true not only to the, the monastics, but for anybody. We spent one whole chapter study, right? Discussing about the quite minor attachments, how we get stuck there. And in case if attachment, not in case, but of course we get attachment and hatred. If attachment and hatred comes, what should we do? We can see them or train them as illusions and emanations. What do you mean by illusions or emanations? Illusion here is like magic creation by a magician. Creation by a magician. Magician can make himself or herself disappear. Things like that, right? Magician. <laughs> One kind of magician is they actually not doing anything, but they're fooling us. They're fooling us. For example, I can take the temple in my hand, you know, then I play some tricks, and then you really see I'm taking the whole temple in my hand, you know, things like that. Then also, there are some chemical substances which, which can fool you, see different things. That's also possible. Possible. For example, if a, if a person, if there is a magician who is reading something, if my eyesight is influenced by that, that spell or that magical substances, then I'll see in the place of a small, small stone, I'll see elephants moving around. But then those people who come later and whose eyes are not influenced by that chemical substance, they'll, they'll see only stones and nothing. For the magician himself, he sees elephants, but he knows it's not elephant, it's something I can eat it. So similarly, when we look at things also, there are people who see things, who, who things appear, for whom things appear to you as having inherent existence, and also you develop the grasping that things exist independently, right? Then there are completely enlightened Buddhas to whom things don't appear as an inherent existence, and also they don't develop their grasping. Then there are others who are on higher spiritual ground to whom things appear as having inherent existence, but they don't develop grasping. So they're different, different things, you know, like like what how we see the, the things created by a magician. So there is a there is a very interesting story of uh, in this story there is a very interesting story of uh, very interesting story to illustrate this point when we say when attachment and hatred arises see them as an illusion or magician magician's creation or or emanation how how things are created by a magician. 
a magician can create things which is not true, but they will they will show you as if they are true. Like there is once there's an interpret there's a story of a very good religious practitioner, a lama, and a magician. They were doing some computation. Then the magician like you know took one knife and put it here, you know, to himself. And the knife coming from outside. So people were like all oh, aghast, you know, oh my God, what is happening? And then Lama who was doing the prayer, he picked up some grains and threw it on the magician. <laughs> and it, he, his, his, his trance came into an end and he had his knife put into a, you know, sack of grains, not to himself, you know. So you can create such, such illusions. Have you seen some of the magicians? Before, you know, in Tibet there were like many, many. I can't exactly call the magician, but we call it lava, lava, like, like the Nejum Oracle, you know. Have you seen Nejum Oracle? We have two, three state oracles, state mediums. So when some important matters of the government is to be decided, then we consult them. When they enter into trance and tell many things what to do, what not to do. It is unbelievable. But I myself saw when I was young, this kind of flowers, you know, who certain certain spirits enter into them. And then there was one I remember very well, his name was Lopsa, Lava Lopsa. So he was actually one of his legs was not working well, he was you know limping. But when he gets into trance. No problem with his leg. Yeah. He jumps like anything, you know, then then he would put an iron into the fire. It's really hot, like red hot. He would take it and lick it like this. You black-headed people, if you don't believe me, see. He would look like I saw this. Then another this kind of lava, they are normally considered when people have some problem. And there was the one. I think a lady, I don't remember exactly, she was bitten by a dog. And then they consulted this lava. Then the lava entered into trance and then he just jumped onto the women and then sucked, you know, with certain parts of the body. And then then he had this drum when they when they sing and dance, they do like this, you know. Then he took his drum and on that he vomited what he had sucked from this lady's body. He won't believe. Four or five small puppies actually moving the same. You see? Then after that, he would now can you believe what I've done? I've taken that out, you know. Then he would put back in his mouth and eat it. So he won't believe these things. Now not many, but we be any. Then we used to have one. Uh, in Puligal, one, one such lava, I never seen him, but I had one. And sometimes, you know, the, the, this this tendency of entering into trance is almost like familial, you know. The father has it, the son has it. So there was his son who was going into the school, very young, but uh, often he would get into trance. So in order to stop that, you need to bring one great. And try it here. You know why we wear the rings here? Why, why, why do we wear the rings here? You normally wear it here, right? This finger. Why? Mm -hmm. But maybe whatever. You may be some relation. Yeah, you may be related to the heart. There may be many reasons. But what I'm saying is in the Tibetan tradition, they say origin may be from India, whatever. <laughs> So in the end of the edition, we say, we say evil spirits enter from this. Evil spirits will enter from here. So if you try it, they can't enter. So in the beginning, all these ornaments that we use were not ornaments. They are for purposes of good health. You see, like, for example, if you put you know, the, the gold thing here on the teeth, it will help you stop getting poison into your mouth. You see? Many things like that. And then similarly, if you have many of these precious gems, 
if you fell down, it will help you not have your bones broken. That's the story, actually. In the beginning, they were not ornaments. The Greeks did not use it as ornaments. Even in America and other countries, today they have this, what you call it, New Age. Have you visited some of the New Age shops in America and other countries? So in America, so I, I visited America many times. In one of my visits, we walked in, we walked in a, a New Age shop for nearly two and a half months. Not, not for money, but just the host who invited me. He has small, small shop, so I go there. So they, they collect all these, you know, gems and other important stones like amethyst and, you know, all those things. So they also say that this stones are many of the stones, this is good for liver, this is good for eye, think like that. Okay. Yeah. So so they are there, there are strange things, many strange things. Another story of Smilan Lama. That happened in Nepal. I never saw it. But I saw it. An article came in the National Geography a long time there. So there was a person who was having this kidney stone or something, problem. Then he consulted this person. And he again sat from there and actually took out a big stone. And that stone he did not swallow back. The, the people from the National Geography, they took it. And they found this is, looks like stone, but not actually stone. But this person also got healed. But he actually had a stone, but what is taken out is look like stone, not stone. Things, strange things like that. Okay. So now here in this case, an example of illusion. In India, I think it happened in India. There was a very good magician by the name Chandra Badra, Nozambo. He has a friend called Paul. And this man, Paul, um, he has his wife and one son or daughter, three, three members in the family. And then this magician, Nozambo, he taught his friend Paul some of the magician's tricks. And he said, I'll teach you. It will be useful for you in the future. And this, this, uh... then he said, no, 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 I don't want your, your, you know, medical tricks. I don't want to learn that. All I want is just one horse. I need a horse, not, not how to play tricks. Mm -hmm. Then, then this friend who said, I'll teach you magic, he said, okay, now he, he doesn't really know the meaning of magic. So the first thing that I should do is cheat him. And what he did was he said, I want a horse. Then he, out of, through, out of his magic power, he created a horse. And for the other person, it was a horse. Okay, he gave this horse. And I thought at least I will receive and teach him a lesson for one time. And it was morning. This this man Paul and his two other family members, three of them, were having have, have finished their brief morning breakfast. And uh, in this gentleman Paul was at the entrance of the room, you know. Uh, making some yarns, and his wife was washing the dishes. And then this magician came, right mount, mounting on a horse. He came mounting on a horse. And then he said, my dear friend, Paul, buy this horse. Buy this horse. Then he said, I have nothing to pay, so I, I don't want to buy, I have no money. Then he said, you just give me some of the yarns that you are making. Then, then he said, then that is okay. And then he decided to, in fact, he thought I can just pull him. Then he 
give some yams, and then uh, he bought the horse. And then, he, then this magician, he said, you should ride the horse and see, see how good it is in galloping, you know. And then this, this gentleman, Paul, he mounted on the horse. As soon as he mounted on the horse, the horse just started running with full speed, no control. Started running the whole day, the sun started sinking, and he stepped into coming into a completely empty, empty land, about which he knew nothing. He was very sorry. He said, This stupid horse, you know, he, he, this stupid horse has taken me to such a foreign land. And then he looked around this way, that way, and somewhere he, he saw some smoke. And then he, run away to the entrance of that, that, that place. Then he knocked the door. And then old, very elderly lady came out. Then he was really thankful, at least there is a person here. But actually it turned out this was not a human being, but a non-human being, not a like human being. But then he said, oh, hopefully this night she may not deceive me. But even if she deceived me, there's nothing I can do. I have nowhere to go. Because if I try to go out in the night, I may be eaten by tigers and you know, jackals and like that. So I have to depend on this woman. So he stayed there, went inside the room. And when he went inside the room, he found there were this woman and the woman had three daughters. And they gave him very tasty, delicious food. And then asked, who brought him here? And then the men narrated the whole story. And then this elderly woman, he said, no, you know, you have nowhere to go. And this island actually is a no man's island. belongs to nobody. And my husband died a long time back. So you, you marry one of my daughter and you should be, become owner of this place. Because if you try to go out, you will reach nowhere. And he also felt probably this is the best thing. And then, then, he, then he married one with one of his daughter. And he went there. And years went, you know, many years went. And then uh, he also had like uh, three, four, two, three sons and daughters. And one day, the mother, his wife went to collect some wood. Then the father took his sons and daughters and went near the river. So they were playing near the river. And then suddenly the moon appeared in the water. And one of the little sons, he went to catch the moon in the water. And then, then the, the child, child got sunk and uh, swept away by the river. It was his son. And when the father ran away to help the child, another son, little son, came after him. And then he had no idea what to do, you know, to take care of this one, one another who is now drowning. So in this process, he was not able to take care of both of them. And meanwhile, the little girl who was a little bit far behind, he was taken away by a tiger. So he was like sometimes shouting to drive the tiger away, looking on. So anyway, he was not able to take care of any of them. All his children he lost. They all died. And he himself was up here. So tired, you know, going up and down. And he was overpowered with sadness and grief, and he sat down and uh, lamenting. And then suddenly the, the wife came and she asked what happened, and he told the whole story. And the woman was so scared and so sad that she committed suicide by jumping into the water. So that the, his wife and all the sons and daughters, they all, all died. And then he was full of regret. I'm the most unfortunate person, never accumulated any merit. And uh, many of them just died in front of my eye, you know. 
so it is better for me to die here. And the saying that he was just pulling his hair. <laughs> and then he found when he pulled his hair, he found his hair was already white. Old man's hair, you see. And he, he felt more sad. And somehow, somehow, um, out of this frustration, anger, he, you know, started leaving that island and started running. And after a while, he luckily reached home, back place from here, from here anyway. And when he went to look at his own old home, his wife was still there singing, you know. And then she, his wife also said, what are you doing? You're still basking in the sun? He left in the morning, right? And then he said, I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm still not completed washing my dishes. This man, he went into this island, married, had children, his hair grew white, all these things. But this, when he came back, it was only just a short, short, short moment. Okay? And he was completely angry, you know? You don't realize how much I have suffered. You're still singing. <laughs> Instead of joining me, you know, in being said, you're still singing. Huh? And you're still saying, go into the sun and, you know, bask yourself in the heat of the sun. And the woman was in doubt, you know, is he not mad? What happened to him? What happened to you? What, what do you mean? You know, you got separated from me for a long time. You had all these problems. So look here, I have not even completed washing my dishes. And then he went inside to see. She was right. She was still washing the dishes. Then he thought, my, my friend, magician, must have cheated me. Because the yarn she was making was still there. I'm finished. Because his friend said, I will, I will take it or I will complete it. Then he thought, when all these people, my friend and wife, they are all saying this, probably I am mistaken. How come that I make such a mistake for so many years that I actually married? I actually had three children and I have actually suffered so much. Huh? So just in one day, how can I have, I can have so much suffering? Hmm? So it's a long story. So, so the, the meaning is, meaning is, meaning is, meaning is, when you are under illusion, when you are under illusion, just like this person who suffered under the magician spell, so similarly, if you are under the spell of seeing things as having no inherent, you know, as having inherent independent existence, then under this illusion, you can suffer. As I said the other day, when you suffer, when you are unhappy, even one moment is very long, just like this person. You know. When you're happy, even one year just goes like this, right? So therefore, the point is not to get entrapped by this illusion of seeing things as having independent existence. There's the meaning, illusion. Then, if you, are, if you are in a place where this hatred and attachment, see them as an illusion, creation of a magician, and see it as an emanation. So it can, the example can be an illusion, it, it, it can be an emanation, it can be a dream.
Okay, may have earlier given you the example of reflection in a mirror or reflection in a television screen or reflection that you see in the water. You can take all these examples of things having no inherent independent existence. But if you get obsessed with that, you will get into big problem. When unpleasant words are heard, see them as an ego. We already discussed this, not to use hard speech, right? When you hear hard speech, if somebody says, you are really like a Buddha. If somebody says, you are really like a Buddha, you may have a name like Buddha, Sangye. Many Tibetans have a name, Sangye, which means Buddha. But you are not Buddha. So don't get too excited if somebody calls you Buddha. Don't get too sad if somebody calls you a devil. Just by calling you Buddha and devil, you will not become Buddha and devil. So don't, don't take too much attention to that. So when you hear unpleasant words, see them as an equal. For example, if I you know, record in my tape recorder saying many nasty things, then I play it again. Or if I shout against the rock, you ugly fellow, the rock will also echo back by saying, you ugly fellow. But when you hear that, you will you get angry? That's what he's saying. Okay. See them as an ego. When harms arise to the body, see it as a result of past actions. When harms arise to, to the body, see it as a result of past actions. Then not, you get nothing without having accumulated some force in the past. Okay. So when some harms come to your body, it doesn't mean that you just don't take care. You take care as much as possible. Still, you might get sick. Still, some harms might come to your body. Then see it as a result of your karma. And accept it. That is the meaning. Accept it. Don't get too frustrated. Don't get too discouraged, you know. Karma means not karma in the past life, not necessarily. Karma means if your harm comes to your body, then you say, oh, because I went into the wrong place. This is your karma. You're going to the wrong place is your karma. The result is your body is now hurt. hurt. Okay. So karma is like a Karma, don't 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 take karma so to the extreme. Karma basically means action. Fruit means reaction. Action and reaction. You do something, it will have its repercussion, its result. So the, the action may be something you've done this morning. This morning you took a wrong food, that's your action. So now you have a stomach upset stomach. This result, karma and result, that's the meaning. So karma is not like something that you've done only in the past, now you, you're helplessly, you know, suffering, not like it. Karma has no fatalistic notion. People who don't understand this, oh, it's a karma, there's nothing I can do. It's the other way around. It's karma, therefore you can do. Therefore you can order. Therefore you can even purify those who bad thing that you've done in the past. Rectify, correct you know, mistakes. Very flexible idea, action and reaction. When harms arise to the body, see it as result of your past actions. Okay? So in this way, see all phenomena, as having no true existence, but they appear as if they are having independent existence, and we are deceived by that. So in this way, you should be ready to welcome and accept all these sufferings voluntarily. And especially you should do this mental exercise or breathing exercise. When you breathe in, imagine you are bringing all the sufferings and problems of other sentient beings. And when you breathe out, 
without give your all the good things that you have. Imagine, you know, affluence, compassion, love, health, happiness. Imagine that with this bread going out, you are sharing everything good you have to other certain beings. Some people, some people, when they do their, their exercise, they feel a little bit uncomfortable because they are already having a lot of problems. And in addition to this problem, if I bring all these other problems of other sentient beings and heave it on me, I will be completely overwhelmed, you know. So what you do normally is, it's not like imagining all the sufferings of the people coming in the form of suits and black, you know, darts and things like that, then putting it on you, not like that. As a practitioner, what you are trying to do is destroy your self-cherishing attitude, right? There's your enemy, that they are inside you. So you bring all these sufferings and problems and put it on your self-cherishing attitude. Then imagine that that self-cherishing attitude is destroyed. You are not destroyed. The self-cherishing attitude is destroyed. That way. Okay, then, then there is no reason you feel uncomfortable. So that is how you should practice also. So in other words, anything good, good name, money, you know, affluence, power, whatever you get, try to share it, give it to others. If you have power, Use that power to help others. If you have money, use that money to help others. If you are famous, use that fame to help others. And if people are having problems here and there, try to share it, take it upon yourself. So give the profit and victory to others. Accept the suffering and defeat. And this is possible if you develop trust in the law of causality. If you do good, result will be good. If you do bad, result will be bad. Okay? This completes the 15th chapter. Now, in the 16th chapter, the question being asked is, for a Dharma practitioner, what should be the place of our practice? We discussed in the little bit yesterday also, what should be the place of our practice? So, it is answered by saying, live well in a remote and isolated place. We, we discussed this yesterday also a little bit here. Yeah like the dead body of a wild animal. Dead body of a wild animal, nobody takes care. Nobody bothers. So it's what actually Miller ever did. The Miller River, if you, if you read Miller River's 100,000 songs, there is a song where he says, one man and Jimmy Meva, Hina Jimmy Meva. That means, if when I get sick, I have nobody asking me, how are you? If I die, there is no traces of blood in the cave where I die, and nobody cries after me, then my wish is fulfilled. Imagine. When I get sick, if there's nobody who asks, asks about my well-being, I'll be very happy. See, the, the strength of the mind of the people. If I'm sick, if there's nobody asking me about my health, my illness, I'll be very happy. When I die, if there's nobody who is crying after me, I'll be very happy. If I meditate in a cave where, where there is no footprints of human beings in my cave, except myself, no other footprints of human beings, I'll be happy. And when I die, there's no traces of blood outside, I will be happy. And in this case, I think there will be no traces of blood because it's so thin, you know, emaciated, you know. 
right? Amazing, amazing, unbelievable. Such such people have happened on this earth. If you read his biography, do read his biography and the hundred thousand songs, especially the biography, hundred thousand songs. In, when we read in Tibet, it's so beautiful, but the English translation, I don't know who that is. So at least the biography we should read. So when this question is asked, what is the place for a practitioner? Live well in remote and isolated. Live well means continuously live there in the remote, isolated place. Like the dead body of a world animal. Don't worry about other people. Whether they're talking about you or not, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. But you, you will have a lot of company. So many of the birds who are singing there, they will not say anything bad about you. Even if they say, you have no idea what they're saying. Right? If you live in the company of human beings, you'll find so many people talking about you, saying bad things about you, good things about you, you know? Not necessarily kind of you know, bullying you, teasing you, you know, you, you will be drawn into that conflict, you see. So one should hide oneself. One should hide oneself and live without attachment. Hide oneself. Because if you do that, then you will get a wonderful opportunity to see yourself who you are. Right now, the least known thing is yourself. About other people you know a little bit, about other things you know a little bit. About yourself, not much, you know. Because you you've always been wanting out of it. Right? Your home, which is your inside yourself, which is like your home. You kept it locked for a long time. You have been always going outside for so long. And you did not put any caretaker or guard there. So the house is now dilapidating. It is collapsing. It is collecting, you know, insects and cobwebs. Exactly what happens in our house, which we don't take care. Of. So similarly, inside, you hardly go inside, so you don't know your potential. You don't know the negative emotions. You don't know how to eliminate them, right? So therefore, if you, even if you are unable to hide yourself all the time, make it a point that you hide yourself occasionally. It's really important to stay alone and reflect within yourself. And you get more peace also. So, so when this question is asked, what is the best place for a practitioner? He says, your fatherland or motherland. Your fatherland or motherland is a big prison. Your fatherland or mother. We, we, we are so fond of my, you know, my, my fatherland or my motherland. But it, for a very strict practitioner, your fatherland is, is a big prisoner. Now, what is the worst company of a practitioner, the normal practitioner? He says the worst company or friend of a practitioner is human activities, ordinary human activities. Unceasing, unceasing, never ending, ordinary human activities. If you join that, that's the worst company for a dharma practitioner. What is the one that becomes a bondage for the dharma practitioner? The one that is the biggest bondage for the dharma practitioner is partiality. My country, my friends, my family, my enemy, you know, biased attitude, and likewise arrogance, name and fame. And what is the worst food for a Dharma practitioner? The worst food for a Dharma practitioner is, is those, those kind of foods 
which you earn through wrong livelihood. And what kind of conduct is the best and worst conduct for a Dharma practitioner? The worst conduct for a Dharma practitioner is running too much, jumping too much, sleeping too much, eating too much, drinking too much. Right? Whatever exercise. Do the we might say do a little bit of exercise, but for those very strict practitioners, we are not worried about exercises because their their focus is different. Yes, I don't have time for anything else. You see, for us ordinary people, even if you are dharma practitioner, we recommend you do some exercise, take care of your health. We do have to say things like that. For but for those very strict practitioners. They have no time for anything else. What is use of my exercise if I'm going to die tomorrow? If I'm not able to accumulate any of these positive things, if I'm not able to purify my negative deeds, what is what is use of my, you know, having good food, good house, things like that? Right? <clears throat> so he says, in short, if you want to know all these details, you should study the three bit of us. And then he asks another question, you know, among the enemies, which enemies are the worst enemy? You know, the worst enemy is your negative friends, which I explained yesterday. Those that will continue toward, contribute towards your you know, weakening your love, compassion, things like that. And what is the best way to, uh, for a monk or a nun, what is the best obstruction? For a monk, the best obstruction is women. For a nun, the best, the, the worst, sorry, the best, worst obstruction is men. So give them up. What is the best way to serve the Lama? The best way to serve the Lama is whatever you do, do make it you know, sure that this, this becomes a Dharma practice. Then he asked a question by saying, what about making them offerings, you know, food, clothing, money, things like that. This is even lay people can do. So that means for a serious monk or monastery, then the best way to serve the teacher is not making material offerings, but practicing what he or she is asked to do. And what is what is what are the places where the monks and nuns should be fearful? They should be fearful of cities and towns. And what is what what is the problem with that going there? The problem is if you go there, then your efforts and your receptors will be your brothers, sisters, and parents, because you don't have efforts and things like that. And instead of your listening to the Dharma, meditating on the Dharma, you will talk about how to put the small children, how to multiply your wealth. And then your heart will always be after that with the women, handsome men, and you will be deceived and cheated by their smile and beautiful words. And temporarily, you might think this is an amazing life, but then gradually, your celibacy will be lost. Then when you lose your celibacy, people will also, you know, make fun of you that he's an ex monk and they will start hating you. And then you die, you go to negative state of existence. So therefore, therefore, place of your practice should be a place of, a remote place, place of solitude. And what is the, in that place of solitude? What is the process of dying? The process of dying is like that wild animal, which we already mentioned. 
normally we say like a wounded wild animal. If you are like wounded wild, wild animal, then you have no fixed place. You just give one from one place to another place. That's what this great practitioner Milarepa used to do. Thomas Milarepa. He had a sister, this poor sister, they suffered much. And then uh, when Milarepa was meditating, no fixed destination. He was moving from one mountain to another mountain. The sister, poor sister, she was also like begging. And you know, there's a, there's a very sad story. But somehow she wanted to find her brother as much as possible help, help him. So when there are many stories. At one time when she met her brother, and his brother was sitting there completely naked. When the sister cried and saying, what is this clothes? What is this way of the practice? I've never seen any people practicing that practice. You have even lost the sense of shame. Look at it, like a big little magic. And then also look at this other Dharma practitioners. They come, you know, in, in a cavalry of horses, you know, they, 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 when they, this great lamas come, they come with, you know, long lines of horses riding on them with banners and canopies, you know, people welcoming them, look at you. Then he, then he said, my sister, if I do a false dharma practice, I can do, I can do better than these people. Real Dharma practice. Real Dharma practice. Many a times she was invited to come and settle down in the town because the people they had no respect to him, and then they said, You will die like this, you know. And you 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 can give teachings and we'll we'll pro provide you all the food and clothing, bills, everything. He said, no, no, no. These are all distractions for me. So read that story, amazing, unbelievable. We may not be able to do it, but we can at least get some uh, inspiration. So die like a wounded animal. Wounded animal, they feel bury themselves, you know, nobody will help them to, to bury. Then a question is asked by saying, then after you, you are dead, because normally when you are dead, then, then you will be burned, whatever, then you bring the ashes, or even when you are being burned, the monks and others invited to do the prayers, you know, then you bring the ashes and make something out of it. So what is the process of all this? How should we do this if we, if we die? What is the process of it? Burning the, what, what is the process of disposing the dead body? And here, look at this is very, very interesting and very necessary for all of us. Atisha does not recommend any ordinary process of disposing your dead body, which we are doing these days. He says, he says, the first thing which is like burning your body, is morality. The second important thing for disposing your body is having no impeachment. The third thing to dispose your body is we have reached a place of security, meaning if you've done proper practice, then at the time of death, you only reach a place of security where no harms of negative emotions can come. For this, uh, having this disliking to the samsara, and for this, having eliminated all those that has to be eliminated and having all the necessary realizations. So that is the thing, you see. Many people, when they die, they don't know how to handle the body thing. But the most important thing is when you are alive, you should do your practice in such a way that when you die, you don't have to worry about your dead body. The dead body is like any other piece of, you know, food or anything. It's a lifeless thing. Why you are so worried about it? 
in many systems and countries. Out of attachment, you know, number one, now in, in, in today's modern world, so-called developed modern world, nobody actually wants to talk about death. Death is a taboo subject, right? In Buddhism, this is one thing that you should talk all the time. This is part of the packet, part of the deal. Life, death, you know, like day and night, you know, you need to talk about it. In many countries, they, 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 death is almost a taboo subject. They don't talk about it. And also, we now hardly see people dying. They're held, they are handled in the hospital and we waste away. Nicely put in a coffin. Then go to this cemetery, which is also not nearby, a little bit far away. And then in the cemetery, you know, where the corpse lie, it's, it's decorated so nicely. This is really like again clinging after that person. Not much use. And if you feel comfortable, you have every right to do it, but not much use. Not much use. So as is suggested here, if you live your life well, you reduce negative emotions, cultivate positive emotions, then actually nothing to worry. What is important is the journey of the mind, the consciousness. If that consciousness and the mind had accumulated enough store of marriage, no need to worry. If that has not been done when you are alive, you invite the most famous Brahma, which, uh, you know, nothing can be done. Even if you invite Buddha, nothing can be done. There is a story at the time of the Buddha, there was a war going on and people were killing each other. Then somebody came and hid under the Buddha's you know, box or something, you know, the begging bowl or something. When at the end of the war, so many people were dead there, and this person who was hid under the Buddha's begging bowl was also found dead. Meaning, maybe true, maybe not true, but the meaning is when you're you know, karma to live is exhausted. Nobody can prolong your life. So similarly, you know, the, the prayers and the prayers of the lamas, especially those who are more advanced, they may be of some help, but not much help. I mean, imagine if you, throughout your life, you do all the bad things, accumulate a lot of negative deeds and sins, and then finally, at the time of the death, a lama comes, does the prayer, and gets, gets purified. This is like gravity. Right? So there's no possible. It may be of some help, but not much. So he says here, gets a rangi chagoso. That means the real practices of the virtuous practices must be done by oneself. Gesa rangi chagoso, nyangi rangi kurgoso. Suffering also one has to carry, whether you like it or not. If you had accumulated bad things, the result you have to carry. No, no one will come from you. And how to carry these sufferings? How to carry means how to tolerate these sufferings? That you should know much in advance. That means when it comes to the question of challenging and facing the sufferings, you should know. If you know, then as I said, when you get challenges, sufferings, problems, you will be able to handle it very nicely, very properly. No need to worry. Hmm. So don't, he said, then he says, that means if you wait until the last moment, Already too late. Too late. Especially meditation, practice, all this must be done when you are young. When your channel, nerve, mind, flow, energy, when everything is energetic and fresh, then you can achieve many things. But when you become very old, 
you might want to do many things. You are not able to remember the prayer. You are not able to remember the names. You are not able to see it properly. You know, your eyesight also failing. They're not easy. But unfortunately, you know, what we normally do is we think that when you are young and energetic, then you do business and run the household activity, things like that. When you are completely worn out and you are unable to do all these ordinary activities, then this is time to do Dharma practice. This is just, just a job, big job. When you can't do ordinary, orderly human activities, how can you do advanced spiritual practices? In Tibetan society also we have this very bad way of doing, you know, when somebody becomes very old and can't do any of this day-to-day -day household, then they, then they say, now I become, you know, a monk. Until now you're married, had many sons, the children, you're running, running, running. Now you're old, you're unable to do this. They say, now I'll become a monk. I mean, it's better than, you know, nothing. <laughs> but, they, but that is the, you know, wrong way. That's the wrong way. That's the wrong way. Mm. So at the time of the death, you receive some teaching, it is useful. Of course, it will be better. It, it is good. Mm. So just like, just like, you know, when you just like to make a horse run, you need to repeat, repeatedly use the whip. Similarly, we need to use this whip to ourselves, to institute yourself, to continuously engage in the Dharma practice. Okay? So this completes the 16th chapter. Seventeen chapter. Always be firm with your commitment, firm or stable with your commitment. And when laziness and attachment to sensual pleasures arise, then review and scold yourself. Yeah. Review and scold your scold yourself and recall the essence of ethical conduct. Always be firm with your commitment. As we discussed this morning, before you do anything, study it, analyze it properly in Dharma practice also. And then when you think that this is really important, very important, then you make a commitment. And that commitment should not be short-lived. Like as I said the other day, that for the first few days when you're exposed to such Buddhist teachings, you get so excited. Wow, this teaching is so good, wonderful. I want to do this like this. You know, you get so excited, you you are, you, you don't, you even forget to take your food. Then after three days, you forget everything and there is no traces of your being exposed to such Dharma teaching. A such person will get nothing. So therefore, you should maintain your perseverance and effort like the running stream. We discussed this earlier. Also. So from your commitment, don't make too many promises and commitments. If you make a promise, make a commitment, then fulfill that promise and continue with that commitment. As we say, promise breakers are Promise breakers are, there is an English saying, promise breakers are worse than dogs. Right? Something like that. Promise breakers. 
So don't break your promise, don't break your commitment, especially if you receive tantric initiation. And then sometimes you may say, I want to do practice, but I'm lazy. And I explain to you all different types of laziness. And more than the laziness, attachment to sensual pleasures. Attachment to sensual pleasure is also another form of laziness. Right? So normally, we, we, we say I'm busy. Everybody is busy. Busy because we are pursuing the sensual objects. And because of this relentless pursuit of sensual objects, we had really get time to do spiritual practice. And we keep on postponing the spiritual practice, saying that I'll do it next year when I again come back to Dhamma. Until that time, goodbye, Dharma practice. Something like that, right? So that is not good. You are here, you receive some teachings. Then try to do it whenever you have time, as much as possible, at least possible few hours, if not possible, at least you know 20, 30 minutes every day. Right? The more you study, the more you reflect, then the more you again mix into the world into the world, the more you will be able to see the goodness of goodness and importance of Dharma practice. So this morning when we were driving up, I saw one ex-monk, former monk, going down. And uh, somebody said, he is a very nice man. I said, ex the former monks, ex-monks are normally very nice. Why? Because they were, when they were monk, the reason that they become monk, they thought I need to do all this. He saw all this importance of all these virtuous qualities. So he was doing all these practices. Then somehow he or she get disrobed. When he, he or she get disrobed, then I can beg into the same samsara. Welcome back the familiar samsara. You're back. And then for a short time you enjoy. Because when you are a monk or nun, you know, you're, you, you're excluded from certain temporary pleasures. And you are, as a human being, you are tempted to that. Now you are back. So for a short time, you enjoy. Then after a while, you see all the problems. Then you again long for this. Monghood or nonhood, you see, which they have already lost. Then they at least start thinking, that the only thing I can do is be a good person. So the monk, disrobed monks and nuns are normally good. That's why in places like Thailand, they say, in Thailand, you know, the, the tradition is not like the Tibetan tradition. In the Tibetan tradition, if you become a monk, it's for whole life. In Thailand, it can be for two months. It can be for four months. It can be for one year. It can be to six years. It's up to you, which is also good. Which is also good. So it is said that girls, they are waiting for the, for the former monks. <laughs> And especially they, they ask about this this man, especially they know that he's been monk for 10 years. He must be good. I'll marry him. <laughs> so like that. So what I'm saying is our attachment to sensual pleasures is because we are not aware of the bigger happiness, pleasure, happiness, bigger happiness. If you are very cognizant and aware of the bigger, the more secure, long-lasting happiness, then you will not be so attracted to many of these temporary pleasures. But somehow we are human beings. We are not going to become Buddha one day. They have all the, you know, faults and foibles. So, and then laziness, of course. Because of this, if you develop attachment to sensual pleasure, etc., then you should rebuke and scold yourself, saying that, haven't you made a commitment to do the Buddhist practice? Then you scold yourself. Are you not a man? Are you not a Buddhist practitioner? All these things. Rangirang, 
to yourself. You don't need a special teacher to do that. You need to remind yourself, reprimand yourself, and recall the essence of ethical conduct. Recall the essence of your practice. And therefore, if you are becoming lazy, postponing your practices and things like that, then you should immediately think about the impermanence of life. Because laziness normally comes to those people who have no idea about impermanence. Mm -hmm. Wait. You have no idea about the urgency and shortness of human life. If you are fully cognizant of that life, and you also have no idea about the possible sufferings that you will encounter after death. The more you are aware of this fragility, impermanence, and the possible sufferings after death, the more you'll be able to lessen your laziness. So it is important to, to stick to the fundamental practice. Don't engage in too many activities. That's what is saying. The fundamental practice means Fundamental practice is how to defeat the self-grasping, which is the root of everything, samsara, even nirvana. Even nirvana. Nirvana is, nirvana is something that we all aspire to. But if you achieve nirvana just for yourself, then again there is a tent of self-grasping. So, it's not enough just to cut a few branches and leaves of a poisonous tree. If you want to do away with this poisonous tree, <laughs> cut from the root, uproot it completely. So likewise, the source of all these negative activities, negative emotions, sufferings is self-grasping, uproot it. So if you know how to do this, you are really a friendly person. And if whenever you know that this is there is a strong self-grasping, then you should remember that this self-grasping will project me into hell. So day and the night, you should scold and rebook to yourself if you're not practicing. Because it is by laziness, all your efforts will be destroyed. So don't give up your commitment. This completes the 17th chapter. Okay. Question answers. Yes. This time in the nature is going to how often uh, for how long should we stay? I mean, for, for common people like this, for how long we can stay in this kind of retreat and how often? Now you have to be realistic also. Okay. I think I told you this story of a person who was very attracted by the practice of Milareva, the great sage. And uh, he wanted to become like Milareva, so he threw away all his belongings. He threw away all his belongings to emulate, to follow the example of Milarepa. But within two, three days, he started suffering because his mind was not strong like Milarepa. Then he, then he said, this is Milarepa. Not only he is a beggar, he also made me a beggar. <laughs> so, 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 so we, we, you know, we have a tradition saying, if the fox tries to jump where the tiger is jumping, 
the fox will bring it back. Okay. The fox will not be able to jump. So they, 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 I'm not trying to describe, but what I'm saying is we have to make effort as much as possible, but also have to be realistic. Have to be realistic. For example, there are some people, sometimes people come to me thinking, I want to become a monk. I want to become a monk. There are other good teachers who say, yes, yes, very good, very good, become a monk, become a monk. But I'm, I'm a little bit of met from different faculty, you know. So I tell them, well, this is good, but where are you going to stay? How are you going to look after yourself? You know, all these things. So similarly, in your case also, or in the case of other practitioner also, how much practice you are able to do is basically up to you. One thing that we need to do is, I have to do this practice until you die, and you possible for many lives to come. That, that kind of, at least, prayer you have to make and commitment you make. Then actual terms, how much you are able, you know, able to do. This is dependent upon many things. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, very good advice, as always. He says, 50-50. <laughs> His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, 50-50. 50% for this life, 50% for the next life. Hmm. For this life, you need to eat, you need to serve up, so you have to work. It's also good even when you work. Make effort that this becomes a dharma, dharma practice. If you change your mental attitude, you can get money and also become a dharma practice. Double benefit. This is all how you do, how you think. Then, yeah, of course, Every day, spend at least 10, 15 minutes to start with. Like right in the morning when you get up, you know, don't just watch the television, no, no deal with the kitchen. If not, not like that. If, if necessary, for that practice, if necessary, then get maybe 10, 15 minutes earlier. If your time is short, then get 10, 15 minutes earlier, which is not a big sacrifice, a sacrifice that we can all do. Then, without having to deal with the wife and children and television and kitchen and things like that, just, just think that I'm lucky. I again walk up. Where is the guarantee that you will wake up every day? Where is the guarantee? So, thank you. Don't take it for granted. Amazing. I walk over here. I have this place, precious human life. I have this amazing brain. You know, and then at least there are many practices to do, but to make it short, make a promise saying that today I will make my, today I will make my life meaningful. Whatever you are going to do, will do it so that this becomes constructive, beneficial to many people. So this is like charging the battery. Make that promise. Then in the evening when you come back from your home. Especially before sleeping, don't just you know, I'm down, don't just sleep without thinking. Or especially don't don't just sleep by watching a horrible movie, horrifying movie, movie of violence, things like that, and then sleep. No. And then then think that I made this promise. Have I fulfilled the promise that I made this morning? If so, rejoice. I made my life meaningful. I will do the same thing tomorrow. If somehow you have not fulfilled your promise, then you should say, yes, I failed. Everybody fails. I'm not a bad man. Everybody fails. I failed today. But I will not fail tomorrow. You know, like that. Whatever, if you do work for one hour, there is a beginning, there is an end. If you do work for one day, there is a beginning, there is an end. So for all your activities, the motivation should be there, good motivation should be there in the beginning. Then in the conclusion, there is dedicate, dedication, rejoicing. That must be there. 
So if you dedicate all the good things that you have done in one hour, or you know things like that, then that is like depositing you know, your money in the bank. Like depositing your money, you're putting your money in the bank. Most of the banks in the world today have not much interest right now, but at least hopefully for their small security, whatever, something like that. Okay, it's like good investment. <clears throat> All right, yes. Uh, when do we know if we accomplish, for example, a type of meditation? When we accomplished? Uh, for example, a type of meditation. From the morning session we spoke about. For example, if you are meditating on compassion. Okay. So in the beginning, you don't even know the definition of compassion. Then you learn definition of compassion. How many types of compassion there are? You don't know in the beginning. Then through study, you know there are three types of completion. Things like that. Then you see this really, this thing called completion is really good. So the important thing is this is really good. But do I have it? That's the important question. Do I have it? You don't have it. How can I have it? Then, then you think about the benefits of having completion disadvantages of not having compassion, then you try best, try your best to implement it. Become compassionate. You will not become perfectly compassionate one day, two days, it will take a long time. Don't worry, but you are improving. Improving. And then gradually, whenever you see somebody, you, you feel that strong concern. And automatically, your heart kind of pours out. And your hand reaches out to help others. And there's a sign. You made very good development. Okay, and then gradually you train, 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 train. Then one day you reach a reach a stage where compassion will come automatically without having to make any effort, effortless. Then that means you have really developed compassion. But of course, that will take time. It will take time, but but it is possible. It is possible. Okay, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, lazy, uh -huh. about being lazy. If you can expand a little bit about what are the causes, like different causes that make us be lazy, or how can we solve it? Or like laziness, according to my own personal experience, laziness is also a habit. If you sleep today, you might like to sleep tomorrow also, because you you already enjoy the the, the warmth of your bed. <laughs> You know, comfort of your pillow, uh, so nice. <laughs> so you need to break that habit a little bit. Acknowledging that you need to sleep. I'm not saying don't sleep, you need to sleep. Especially we are beginners, the ordinary people, we need to rest. So here what you do is you should cut down many of those useless activities, which makes you tired. Because with many of these useless activities, if you try to do all these useless activities, naturally you will get tired. When you get tired, then you have to sleep. So for a practitioner, you know, go to bed a little bit early. Possible. Go to bed a little bit early and get up a little bit early. If not too early, he's always the dilemma when he gets away three thirty. Every day, three thirty. But don't get surprised. He get goes to bed also seven thirty or something like that. <laughs> and then the Christian practitioner Thomas Martin also does the same. He gets two thirty or something. Christian practitioner. You have have you heard about this Christian practitioner, famous Christian practitioner Thomas Thomas Martin? I mean that American place or you get so many the monastery he led to us called Get so many in Kentucky. In Kentucky, there's a small hut where he used to meditate also near the monastery. I, I visited that monastery a long time ago. So he used, he used to get up at 2.30. Probably he goes to bed even earlier. But what I'm saying is, if you want to practice, there should be discipline. The amazing thing that I observed with his own as the is he always goes go to bed at the same time. 
get up at the same time. And because of this personal discipline, he manages to do meditation, he manages to go around the table, he manages to do prostration, he manages to watch BBC, what's happening around the world, he manages to go to the office and see everybody. He's able to do everything because he does everything in time, there's a discipline. Whereas in our case, we don't have discipline. Sometimes we stay until 2 p.m., you know, <laughs> for this party, that party, things like that. And then next morning you're unable to get up. Right? So we have to have some discipline, taking care of our health and also to have success in your practice. Okay, number one. Number two, attachment to many things, sensual pleasures, as already said. You know, we start thinking that better than this meditation is go for shopping. Better than doing this meditation is watch this latest movie. Everybody is saying so much about this movie. I shouldn't go there. So you postpone your practice. That is laziness. The another laziness, as I explained to you earlier, is this despite this despising despising yourself meditation is important but how can i do it i'm not very clever you know you look down upon yourself you discourage yourself that is also laziness uh -huh. so there are many many different types of laziness yes behind there's somebody already here yeah, yeah. What I so... his hand was like this i noticed yeah yeah, so from what I understood, he said that maybe the Jogu made the compassion job from outside, right? And as a grown up, we, we can find it from inside and only from outside. Mm. And but still, like, we need a Sangha and we need a compassion. So. True, true, true. It's not that you don't need to. Love and compassion from others. Of course, you also need all sending beings need. Especially you need the caring love and the, you know love and the compassion of your teachers, other things. Yes. Yes. Therefore, therefore you should, you need to find good teachers. If you can't find good teachers right now, don't worry. Don't worry. Take time. Take time. And I always recommend for the time being, you know. See His Holiness the Dalai Lama as your teacher. You don't have to make a personal request. Okay? And then many of his teachings are online available. This is, of course, because of his age, he doesn't give a very lengthy teaching. But if he, when he was younger, he used to give like seven hours teaching. I used to translate that seven hours of teaching, and by the end of that teaching, every day I was almost dead. <laughs> <laughs> really, and this only as after like and this seven hours a day teaching maybe for two weeks, and after completing the teaching, his illness is full of joy. <laughs> well, I've done what I need to do. That is wonderful, amazing. So many people benefited. I'm able to teach them or whatever. Good things you may be thinking is just full of joy, you know. Whereas I'm happy, it's not joy. <laughs> Very good, yeah. So, so then gradually you find teachers. So, you know, the important thing is you should, you should find a teacher. Of course, Buddha is your teacher. And then, if you want a personal teacher, you know, of course, even if you say personal teacher, you can't afford to have that person with you all the time, you know. You are in different country, the person may be in different country. So that's not, not possible and also not needed. Right? They take time. As other people, there are many good teachers. Important is find a good teacher. Good teacher means one who can teach you, number one, that's very important. Otherwise, you cannot be a teacher. And then second thing is you should be really compassionate. Who doesn't take advantage of the student? There are many, many cases of wrong teachers, exploiting their money, exploiting their, you know, everything. 
I mean, not just in the integrated society, in many, many places. Because people are people, they are primarily looking for money, you see, unfortunately. Right? So, so look for a teacher who is very kind, compassionate, and learned. And you will find her home. Meanwhile, you have Buddha, you have His Holiness Lila. Yeah. Uh, with the um, magician and the elephant and the stone, um, so is Buddha the one who sees the stone but not the elephant? And could you say? Buddha, what? In the example of the magician with the stones and the elephant, and there were three types of people. One saw the elephant, just the elephant, the people with the yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. Then is it the Buddha that sees only the stones and not the, no, the Buddha is the one who does not see the stone as an elephant? Does not does not it does not appear to him as an elephant and also does not have grasping. And then what's the difference between him and the magician then? Magician, magician, it appears to him as an elephant yes. because his eye is already affected by the yeah. chemical substance, but he does not have grasping because he says it's my creation. So is there anything to do with seeing the stone versus the elephant or that has nothing to do with it? I just wondered, is, is the elephant... So, so therefore, 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 therefore what the, this is an example. What we're trying to say is that stone is not an elephant. But when your eye senses are duped by that magical you know, chemical substance, then you see stone as a negative. Yeah. Similarly, when our mind is ignorant, consciousness is duped, then we see what is not having independent existence, we see it as having independent existence. Is it, but is the elephant conventional truth and the stones are ultimate truth? No, no, no. This is just creation of the magician. There was no elephant even at all. There's, there's no true existence at all. Yeah, so like that. You know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, these teachings that teaching mm. yeah. can be put into the practice yes. uh, only in uh, a context. Like when we are in some social situation or when we are in interactions with other people, because uh, that's where it comes into the right and that's where it's not actually based on the stand on. Exactly. So my question is, uh, how important is it to renounce everything and become a monk or a nun? Or uh, are the, is, is practicing dharma teaching majorly about uh, meditation, learning, teaching, and at the end of the day, you are right. That's why yesterday I spoke about the the essence of Buddhist practice into three principal aspects of the path. The first was renunciation. So renouncing everything possible is of course best. But for renouncing everything, it is not necessary you become a monk and nun. There were, there were in the past kings and ministers and other great practitioners in the Buddhist history, like Marva Lozawa. He was a married person. So therefore we have this beautiful teaching which says, if you practice, even if you remain as householder, there is a nirvana. If you don't practice, even if you move high into the mountain and hibernate, hibernate yourself, you will not have anyone, just like the marmot. You know marmot, this animal, little animal who, who hides in the you know, cave or under the ground for six months away in the mountain. If you go to these places like Ladakh, you see a lot of them, you know, they stand like this, you know. So they hide themselves for six months, but they have no liberation, they don't practice, you know, right? But but then, of course, we can, as, as I told you, this story of Melarip and his disciple, you can, cannot at one go say, I renounce everything. It's not that easy. So as we already discussed, what is important is you, you have to associate with other people for the time being, but as much as possible, 
get enough time for yourself, learn to live a little bit in isolation during your practice. Okay? And then that should not create uh, should not create the impression to your parents and things like that. You know, she's I'm not good in, 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 in the ordinary society, if you look a little bit aloof, then they say, what happened to you? You're not talking, what happened, you know? Then you explain with a smile, with a smile, yes, yes, I know, I know, I have nothing wrong with me, I'm doing some meditation and practice. And then you show this cheerful mind, by that they will know she's okay, you see. But if you pretend that you're very serious, then they'll think something is wrong, you know, right? So gradually your practice should affect other people through your behavior. And then with your, with your like uh, people with your age, with whom you associate and go for picnicking and socializing, singing, dancing, whatever they are, they also, you know, you maintain your connection, that's important, but don't say yes for everything. Occasionally you say, I really like to come, but I'm really busy today. So, you know, next time I'll join, you know. Say no politely. This is an art. This is an art. How to say no politely. In many of the things, you know, if you join, it's wasting your time, money, and things like that, you need to say no politely. There is a whole book how to say no politely. Somebody's written a book. I have that book. How to say no politely. Right? So that's important. As I, as I told you, in terms of human connection, it should be your relation. It should be like your relation to the fire. You remember that? Not too far away, not too close. Yes. Um, what does Buddhism say about um, being in love and like having butterflies? Huh? If, <laughs> if you are in love with somebody uh, and you get butterflies, does Buddhism like say that? that Butterfly. But <laughs> generally, 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 as I, I think I said, generally, you know, having sex, for example, you can get butterfly, whatever you know. <laughs> in Buddhism, we never say sex is bad. We don't say. What we say, what we say is sexual misconduct is bad. We never say marriage is bad. Right? So you have you know the proper sex, then you get butterfly, whatever you want. <laughs> like being in love? Is that not like that's okay, but then you love somebody more than other people, right? So it's like conditional. That's okay. It's okay in the sense, if that love to that one person is genuine, you know, not leading to sexual misconduct and things like that, then as I said, that's okay. But you do but, love in a different way than all but, the other. But, that is a kind of contaminated love. It's not unconditional love. That love is okay that you can use it at, at almost like a stepping stone. Then gradually you learn to love, develop this unconditional love for everybody. Okay, you, you no need to see it's just completely contradictory. This is how to proceed. Nobody can develop this unconditional love at one go. You see, we have some kind of love, which is a little bit alloyed with attachment. Then we gradually refine it, becoming purer, 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 and then become unconditional love for other people and even for this world. And then if you finally reach the unconditional love for everybody, yeah. then what's the point of men marrying one person? Because, because the whole you know, system works through reproduction. Because because if you can't if you don't marry somebody you don't have children from where this monks and nuns come from.
Tem mais casos que eles. I'm not just saying it. There's a story of this, the story of this famous, famous teacher, Asanga, whose story I told you, who meditated for 12 years to get a vision of Mitriya. I told you that story, right? Mm -hmm. The same person, his mother, his mother, quite probably. No, no, this mother was a very devout lady. And he thought, I'm a lady, I may not be able to do much practice. So I must marry somebody and have children. Shouldn't I make this my, my sons become good Buddhist practitioners? So she lived with two different people and had two, two kids. And both of these two kids, maybe she, she must be very unique or something, become very famous teacher, Asanga and Muslim uh, Very famous teacher. Yeah, and there are both told tales of bodhisattvas who internationally marry and have one thousand children for them. <laughs> no, okay, so yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Yes, you briefly referred to the five aggregates in this book. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of that? Uh, just wondering, um, if you could expand a little bit on the five aggregates, were they? Physical form, form, mm -hmm. feeling, then what perception, then uh, um, perception. I always say difficulty with the fourth one. Mental formation. Huh? Mental formation. Mental formation. Mental formation. Thank you. My mental formation and then consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you might, um, when we were talking about consciousness and you said consciousness belongs specifically to you. Yeah. And it's not in your, your consciousness. Right. Yeah. Um, so my, I have two more questions. Yeah. Is consciousness what reincarnates? Yeah. And if consciousness reincarnates yeah. and it is inherently yours, yeah. how can there be no, why do we say there's no inherent no, no, no. These, these two different, two, two different. You are using the word inherent in two different. When when we say there is no inherent existence, we are saying there is no independent objective existence. Then the English word inherent also means something that is there with you by birth. Okay, so I'm talking more about this, something that is there with you right from the birth. Okay, not, not the independent existence. So if there's no independent mind. No, 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 nothing, any phenomenon, what, whatsoever. But the continuity is there. As I give you the example the other day, the running stream, it continues but changes all the time. And it seems to me that what we think of as I is really our consciousness. You know, it's not a thing, we know it's not in place even though we come out. So but in Buddhism, we say it's not the consciousness, but this is definitely designated on the consciousness. Yes. Everything is designated, you see. So that, that is the fun of the story. If you search, you won't be able to pinpoint anything. It's just designated. You know, it's, it's not easy. But even consciousness is still designated? Even consciousness is, if you, it is designated. If you try to find out what is consciousness, Split the first moment from the second moment from the third moment, you won't find anything called consciousness. Yeah. 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 Took a few lessons ago about the importance of concentration. Can you give the example of a child playing with a broken toy. Importance of? Uh, concentration. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. And you said sometimes uh, the concentration itself is more important than the things you concentrate. And so my question is, when do you, how can you know when when this is the case? Because I think it's sometimes very easy to concentrate, for example, in my phone, uh, for hours. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think it's good. Mm. So how can I know? Between what? When it's good to concentrate, I don't know. 
Ajahn Chah. Yeah, yeah. If you concentrate on killing somebody. No, no killing. Uh, That's bad. This bad. Yeah. If I concentrate. Yeah. For hours. Yeah. It's good. In the beginning, it is good. Because in the beginning, it is good because the pain doesn't have to be good or bad. But what you're trying to achieve is just concentration. This is the training stage. Then after having achieved your concentration on the pain, you're not going to concentrate on the pain for the rest of your life. Then you shift the focus. Then you concentrate on helping others. Concentrate on developing positive qualities. So in the beginning, yes, the object can be anything. But later on, you shift the focus. Yeah. What is the difference between the conscious and the mind? And is the mind more or same, more or less? Yeah. But you know, the Western definition there may be different, but we have like same, which we have translated as mind, number shiva, which we have translated as consciousness. In that sense, it is same. So if when I meditate, yeah. I hear the thought, thing that I don't agree, thing that I don't control the mind and the conscious. Is part of my conscience that yes, yes, yes. Like yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So 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 there's we say consciousness of mind is like a monkey. If you put one monkey in a room, house which is four or five windows, the windows are small, the monkey cannot come out. He wanted to come out. So inside that hole you have only one monkey. So there's not, not the monkey wants to come out, he just go up and tries to peek through the first window, not being able to do goes to the third window, fourth window. Then a person who is not familiar with the situation, when seen from outside, they might think in this room is full of monkeys. There's only one monkey. So the same, there's, there's just one consciousness, which plays different roles. Then we give different designations. Make sure it's more quiet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the more I ask about humanity, 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 or health, ah, a little bit louder. Humanity. Yeah. I can say that for the Jewish people, uh, if you're Jewish, it's not only the religion, it's also you feel part of you belong, belong to what one community, and I was just for a Buddhist person. Yeah, we also, as I said, we also say, oh, we are the lucky, lucky, fortunate ones, the disciples of having the Buddhist love. You say everybody has this habit of saying things. Yeah, more connection to your community and not others. Is it not a... No, it is meant to always be there. With the attachment, you have more attachment to nationalism or whatever you call it, you have more attachment to your family members, to be more precise. Then the bigger circle, your, your Jewish community, then Tibetans also their families, then the Tibetan community. More, more attachment. But if you reduce the attachment and see the whole humanity as basically exactly the same, then from the parlance of a, a person like Buddha, all same. Same love, same compassion, no difference at all. And that's why his holiness, the Dalai Lama, is like talking about humanity, well being of humanity all the time, even the Chinese. You see? Yeah. Yeah. So this quarters, I think, yeah. Yeah, I want to ask, uh, I assume that because now Buddhism is trying to relieve us from suffering uh, in some kind of way, what does Buddhism think about? Um, psychiatric medicine. Here you go. Psychiatric medicine. It depends who does it. But according to Buddhism, if you are really talking about something like psychotherapy, something like that, psychotherapy yeah. related. As depression, as anxiety. Yeah, 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 yeah. For example, for example, we can treat people through teaching, through advice. By guiding the right thing. So this is almost like psychiatric medicine. The Buddhist teaching is also like that. You know, we don't give active medicine, but we do that. You know, 
more about what combining the two. For example, let's say if someone has a severe case of anxiety and they want to start meditating, start to uh, advance through Buddhism, um, but they don't manage to do is there like some kind of form of way that you already already many psychotherapists, and I believe psychiatric, you know, doctors and others also, I'm I'm sure already many of them are taking things from Buddhism. I told you the other day, the emotional intelligence, huh? the triple focus, There's so many books that I've already written on meditation, full of ideas taken from Buddhism. Some people say it's from Buddha. Many people don't even say it. They pretend that this is their wisdom or whatever, you know, they, they use it. It's already there. It's already there. Yes, you know? Yeah. Eric Epstein is a, um, a Western psychiatrist. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And he is also really fast, really versed. And Buddhist. he has books that are, yes, that talk about. Yes, yes, yes. So there are many Buddhists who also use the modern method to, to heal people. So if you do it honestly, I think there's nothing wrong with it. But there are two layers, you see. One, for example, is, you know, psychiatric treatment or psychotherapy treatment or any other healing process, if you use some of really useful process, I think it's okay. But then all this does not have to make you have a happy, you know, life in the future lives. They're all aimed towards only this life. They don't, they, they will never talk about things having no independent existence or emptiness and things. I don't think they'll talk about it. Unless you are teaching to a Buddhist group, they'll not be able to digest it. So people normally try to help people who have mental disorder, anxiety, and things like that. So, so here I think what is important is before you become. I have a, a friend in a, who's she's a psychotherapist. She, she lives in Miami. Very elderly Indian woman who, who lives there. Whole family lives there. Brothers lives there. He's a psychotherapist, and uh, so so what I have seen is the important point to be noted, as far as my understanding is concerned. The important point to be noted is people run so much after money. We work like a donkey. I'm saying I'm sorry to use this word donkey. We work very hard, running, running for money, whatever, running, running, running. And then we get completely tired, you know, we get depressed. And there's anxiety. You see, the, on, on the one hand, you work, work like a donkey to earn the money. Then you get sick. Then you bring all this money and give it to the psychotherapist. This is the job, you see. This is the job. This is what I, what I was saying the other day. It's not how much money you are making right now, it's also how you live, how you spend, you see. Very clear. Psychotherapy is a booming business in many developed countries. It's on the one hand, you work so hard to the point of making yourself sick. Then there's no alternative left. You go to somebody, you see, and they charge you heavily. It's not like us giving free teaching, you see. Right? There's not much they teach, honestly speaking. You say, lie down, think about your watch, like, then we are already hallucinated, you know. Then we think, oh, my past life, past life degrees, I mean. Some people, they say they're healed, whatever, you know, there are a lot of stories. Lot of stories. Yeah. So the important thing is, don't get sick. If you, if you don't get sick, you don't have to go to hospital, you don't have to go to psychotherapy. Your, your monthly salary may be not much, it's all yours. Yeah. So yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. Um, what are considered high forms of right livelihood? Huh? What are considered high forms of right livelihood? You keep talking about wrong livelihood. What are right you know? livelihood is those livelihoods which you earn not through corruption, not through bribery, not through cheating, 
your true pleasure is right in the good. Okay, wrong livelihood is those that you have been earned through corruption, through bribery, through telling lies, through pretending. Yeah. It's very easy to make money by killing people, not so difficult. Because people are very, very gullible. Really, that's why you should feel more compassion to people. People are very good. You are all listening to me. I have nothing to say, but you are listening. <laughs> In a sense, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, I should uh, don't understand that I didn't think, um, you about physics things in life because um, you you were talking about, let's say, getting married. It's not a bad thing. Why wouldn't you say, like, there is great power in our life? Um, that we can use it for bad and do like bad things with it, but we can like take it and make make the opposite and use it for the the most amazing things thing in life. Like why would you like why would you say it's okay we can do it rather than we can it's it is the sort of the most amazing thing in life. Not so clear. Yeah. Sorry, make it clear. No, like all about like this thing that food, okay. We can eat like any mess and, and use it like in a bad way, but also we can like yeah, yeah. food in a good way. We can like get the connected with people that we are eating with, we can uh thank for the food. We can, like you say uh, if we have it, um oh my goodness, okay. Um like, okay, it's not that try to do not make it uh, worse. Why wouldn't you say there is a, a very good, like, tension in it? That's usually the make out of the biggest thing, uh, the best thing in life. Like, uh, yeah, as far as I heard from you, you were saying exactly like what, what I wanted to say. Say the best out of the situation. Are you saying that? I think actually asking like what what's wrong with being really excited about our partner or being really what is it? No, there's nothing wrong. That's why we have to keep the new No, 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 no. I'm not saying I'm not saying don't get excited. There's nothing wrong with getting excited. There's nothing wrong with singing. Uh -huh. We encourage people like using these powers for good things. Like why do you mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Use use your power, your use your skin, whatever for good things. We never say this is bad. But you keep on saying like uh, it's not bad we can do it, but why wouldn't you look at it and say there is like we can make it? Make the best thing. No, they're, 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 I think I think I got it. There are two, two ways of seeing things. I told you the story of Yashoda, the Buddha's future wife. You know, she was doing so many good works, social services. So the Buddha saw this and he said, Yashoda is such a nice lady, very loving lady, very kind lady. She's doing so many good things. So this is wonderful. He never said this is bad. He said, this is wonderful, but she will not be liberated just by doing that. That's my point. You see, there are so many good things you could, you can do, you can feel it at, at an ordinary level, you know, conventional level. There are so many good things you can do. We should say wonderful, amazing, you can get excited, you can rejoice, that's wonderful. But if you see from the point of view of getting completely liberated from samsara, or oh, more than that, if you your wish is to get completely enlightened and become Buddha, then many of these pleasure-seeking enjoyments are not, not enough. They're not good. They're all strategies. So in that sense. Okay, yeah. Um, it's a little bit up to uh, our topic, but I wonder if you can explain a little bit more about all the story of the Dalai Lama and the Panchalama. 
you know the, the story around it. And uh, I also understand that the current time Dalai Lama says it's going to be the last Dalai Lama, so how it will affect uh, the Tibetan Buddhism in the future. He did not say he is the last Dalai Lama. He said, <laughs> number one, you have been Lama, he's in Chinese prison right now, you know, the young boy. Right at the time when he was very small, you know, he was imprisoned and still nobody knows where he actually is. Whether he's alive or not alive, not at all sure. After so many years, right? He's a reincarnated person. Then also he told him the Dalai Lama, he said, I may be the last Dalai Lama. He never said, I am the last Dalai Lama. And one thing that he clearly said is, I will make all this very clear when I am 90 years old, which is three years from here, right? So we are having internal discussions, you know, things like that. But he will. But I think majority of the people, they really want him to come back. Tibetan and all other followers, devotees, they want him to come back. And his soldiers also very clearly said, if the Dalai Lama, my reincarnation comes, then definitely it will not come in China. Because, because this is not an antagonistic statement. This is a realistic statement because the very purpose of reincarnation is to be able to help others. So you definitely will not be born in a country where there's no freedom. So it may be India, or it may be some other country, it may be any country, right? So that's what he said. So these are not that easy, it will be complicated. But the thing in relation to the Tibetan people, Tibetan people are like also any other people. They put all their hope in his soul, Mr. Devala. If he is there, we are okay. If he is not there, we are not okay. You know, that kind of strong mentality, which I agree a little bit, but not much. Because at the end of the day, you know, the Tibetans need to learn to look after themselves. With the Dalai Lama, without the Dalai Lama. The important point is when the Buddha was passing away, his followers requested him to appoint somebody as his representative. Then the Buddha said, when I am gone, I have no representative in the form of a person. He said, my teaching is my representative. This is an amazing story. So likewise, now we have more than 100 books, audios and videos, countless audios and videos and books of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So in, in the true sense of the term, the Tibetans should really study all this and imagine His Holiness alive all the time in their mind, in their heart and practice then the Tibetans will prosper. But we'll not do that, I know that. We'll not do that, like any ordinary people, they just talk and then don't write it, you see. Then they'll fight among themselves, you know. And this is I mean, similar to any other people. You, see, you can't fight the person who has bullied you, but you fight among yourselves, because they're easier. Things like that, you see. So this is, the Buddhans also give it some salary, you know, no exception. Just like that. But we should really develop the bigger picture. Get his message. The Buddha is not alive today, you see. We are still practicing his teaching, and many, many millions of people are getting benefit from it. So that is it. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, did you say there is something permanent? Huh? Yesterday? Yes, yeah, something permanent, yes. Can you explain and... We say like emptiness. Anything, this is also complicated. Anything that is not produced by cause and condition, we call it permanent, like emptiness. For example, For example, emptiness. Emptiness, we say emptiness is not produced by cause and condition. Emptiness is just, just a concept, you know, abstract quality, okay? Not easy. Can, uh, can one person be reincarnated into multiple beings? Possible. There's that, 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 yes, there, even in the story of the Buddha. 
once you reach such a state, you can manifest yourself into many forms depending upon the need of people. You can manifest yourself as a loaf of bread or somebody who is hungry. So when somebody eats their loaf, that doesn't mean he's eating Buddha. Yeah. But it's a kind of manifestation that he, he does. Then apart from that, we have like a supreme emanation, supremely emanated body of the Buddha. Uh, then uh, his emanation in the form of a great technician. And uh, then, then emanated as an ordinary reincarnation in the, in the, in the case of a home body, you know, a person who which you can see. So there, there are different type of emanations. Emanations. Okay, time is, I think, over. If there is an urgent question, please. Yeah, you have urgent question. Yeah. Wait, if you want. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out my mind. It's like uh, how mystical would have been is for just how much it's just a state of mind. So three things that come to me are like we have the realms. Sometimes I read that they're physical places you go. Other times I read that they're states of mind. We have the deities. Sometimes I read that they're in the sky, kind of sitting there doing things. Sometimes I will read the same thing, like a state of mind and communicate with. And then you have Buddha himself. In some Tibetan books, it says that he was a god, the sheep first, he came to earth to the human to show us. And other times we've got Buddha, and it's just like he just was a human, nothing else. And I'm just trying to think, does in Tibetan Buddhism, do we swing to the mystical and the deities and the places you go, or is it the state of mind? Yeah. Anything that is that we say mystical or miracle means something that your ordinary mind cannot understand right now. We call it miracle, you know. If I do something which is not so familiar to your mind, you say, Kishila, you create miracle, you know. Right? So therefore, there are many things when you reach such high level of realization, you are able to do many things which you are normally unable to do. So that is miracle. So in that sense, because of your purified state of mind, the place you are born is also pure, is also different. As I discussed yesterday, for example, if you engage in sexual misconduct, next life you will be born in a place which is full of mud, you know, broken trees and then quagmires, you know, things like that. So similarly, when your mind is pure, you are born in a place, even on this earth, you know, because of your karma, you may be born in a place where, where the environment is clean, people are nice, facilities are good, or you may be born in a place where you are deprived of these facilities. So, so something like that. So the more you purify your mind, then the more you have this capacity to enjoy all kinds of emanations and experience all kinds of heavenly you know, facilities and things like that, something like that. But even if you use the word God, we are not thinking about a greater God. There is that concept is not there at all in this. Even the Buddha is not a God in the sense of being a greater. We simply call him the living enlightened person, one who is removed all the negative beliefs and uh, uh, accumulated all the positive beliefs, removed all the sufferings, knows everything, that's all. No, you can ask a lot of questions. How can you prove that he knows everything? So a lot of you know, questions are of course there. A lot of questions, unanswered questions are there. Yeah. So when people do online and yeah. are they speaking, are they communicating with the deity? No, 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 not communicating. Communicating, aspiring, aspiring, aspiring. Aspiring. Aspiring means, for example, this is, I mean, a normal behavior, you know. You know, if your brother or sister is living, say, thousands of kilometers from here, you can pray for them, right? Not necessarily you are talking on the phone, but even otherwise you can pray quite way. With this prayer, are you able to communicate or not? It's a different question when it comes to ordinary person to another ordinary person. But when it comes to your prayer, especially if your prayer, prayer is really, really serious and uh, helpful, 
then you may be able to communicate. That's why people say, for communicating in a message from an ordinary person to another ordinary person, you need a mo mobile phone, you need a connection. But to communicate to the God, you don't need a mobile phone, you don't need a connection, you know, you can, you can easily connect. Right? So possibilities are there, but that is very much dependent upon how sincere and fervent your prayer, how pure is your prayer. It's not easy, not easy. But, it, but then at the same time, whether the Buddha hears it or not, but for you, it's a good exercise. You feel happy having done that prayer, having at least aspired, developed that one expression, positive expression. So it's good for you. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so, sorry, not one last. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sprouts. Yeah. During this lifetime before my death. Yeah. Does my state of mind swing between the God realm, desire realm, and the ghost realm, or the only state of desire realm? See, there is a line in Shadi Devas, what is Charyavatar, where he says, Who, who prepared this burning, burning iron ground? Because in the hell realm, we say there is a burning iron ground. Who prepared this burning iron ground? In the hell realm, who prepared this host of beautiful deities to, you know, entice you? These are all result of your mind, how you think. You, you will have heaven based on your thinking. You will have hell based on your thinking. It doesn't have to be a place deep down or a place like hell. It can be anywhere in today's human realm. There are people who are living almost like a hell in the hell. They have nothing to eat, nothing to wear, you see. In South Africa, you see some people who, some small kids, you know, who really have like their skin is almost like their cloth. Loose skin, you know. Eyes are bulging out. Stomachs are like empty, and you know, it's almost exactly like the hungry ghost that we describe in the Buddhist hell realms, you see. And then there are people who are burnt alive in war or in other ways. Probably this is all hell. And it can come anytime. It can come anytime, depending upon one's own mental attitude. In our day to day life, also, sometimes when you, you know, you get, I could say, you get a glimpse of. All those things. Like if your mental attitude is good, you are sincere, you do something good, then it's very likely that in the night you get those wonderful experiences of being in a wonderful place, you know. And sometimes you, you get this dream of a place which you about which you have no idea. But you end up there. And then sometimes because of certain of your negative emotions like anger and so forth, you get a dream of going into another place where you get a lot of problem. Your hands are cut, your legs are cut, you are sleeping, dreaming, but you really experience this horrible, you know, torture. So this, this shows that it's related to your mind. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know I am not answering everything, but something like this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. See you tomorrow.